What's the next step? Anyone else want to join the discussion? So let's say you have a member, you, you have some external forces, whatnot, you have the reaction forces on one end of it, right? So you want to see how much um, uh, deformation you will get from this member. What do you do next? That have sections, right? Should we go over that one more time? Or are you just warming up? Okay. Now I want to do this because it's, like I said, it's pretty much the same uh, for torsion as well. Right, so let's say you have this uh, member that is axially loaded, right? So you have a number of external loads, one, P1, two, three, three, four, whatever it may be, and you have all the geometric uh, you know, information, you have the lengths, you have the cross-section area, and so on. And we want to know how much deformation there is in each of these sections. In other words, uh, what does L1 become after this? Force. What does L2 become, L3, and L4, and so on? Okay? So, what are the steps here again? Now, this already is a free body diagram, right? So, this assumes that you already know all the forces that, that are here. Chances are you will get P2, P3, maybe P4, right? By, by the problem that, that's given, and then you need to calculate what P1 is, right? Like, like the example that we did last time. So, for example, you have a support at P1. Okay, so what do we do next? Yeah? We just start making cuts going from right to left and then figure okay. out the forces. Good. Um, we, we start, you know, that's the method of sections, right? So you, you want to do that. Uh, again, you go from right to left, that's fine. You don't have to, okay? That's, that's your decision where, where you go. But, you know, you start from one end and then go the other direction. And always make those cuts where? Um, right before each force. Right before each external force that you see. So if you, if you go from the right, you make your cut right before P3. P3 right? Then, so that way, all you're left with is that P4. right? So that's your internal force there, P4. Why do we do this again? Do you remember? So what was the formula? It was the integral, very good. So, so the, the, it was the integral of nx, ax, dx, over dx, right, from 0 to l. That was the integral, right? And you can do that, but we found a simpler way to solve this, right? What was the idea? So what if n is constant, a is constant, and e is constant? And when I say constant, these are constant over a specific region, over a specific uh, section of, of this member, right? And then, if that is the case, you can take all of them out of the integral, and then that, that would become n a uh, n l over a. Yeah? And l, l being what again here? This L is the length of the section, right? Uh, I, I'm going to just write a uh, section here so, you know, hopefully that helps you remember. So that top integral is from 0 to L, uh, you know, so it starts from, it starts from this end, right? From 0 to L, that's the integral, right? But that's, um, you know, second uh, equation uh, is for each section, so like one section here, one section there, and so on. Okay, so that's the idea here. And uh, in each of those sections, the idea is to keep the internal force area and be a constant value. Okay. Yeah. If you're starting from right to left, right to left. Okay. Would you make so? I know you definitely make the cut before P three. Um, for the, for the next cut, would you make it right before P2, even though the length, like the air, the area that goes Okay, is. so you just, uh, you, you took uh, words out of my mouth. So what, what's the answer to this question? Very good question. 
So we cut right after L4, right? That's the, let me repeat the question. So this is one section, let's call it section one, right? And we saw that equation for section one. Section two is where? Is it here, is it here, is it where? Before point two, before the what? The area is different, okay? So, well, okay, so we have one vote for before P2, one vote for the right at the end of L3. Let's, let's take a vote. What do y'all think? Hmm? So this middle one or the left one? Middle one. Middle one, yeah, hopefully everybody sees that. Why is that? Why? Because there's a change in area. There's a change in area, right? You need to uh, pay attention to that. So according to that equation, the area needs to remain constant, right? It is true that between P3 and P2, we don't have any other external forces. That is true, so um, the internal force remains the same. But A is changing the denominator. So you can't take that out of the integral, right? So that uh, formula won't work for the entire L2 to L3. So you have to make a section there. Does that make sense? Good. So, so the, the problem that we solved last time, we had a bunch of these external forces, right? But the area was constant throughout the, 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 the member, right? So this has an additional step there where you need to make a there. So those are your um, four sections, basically. Yeah? Would you um, write your NL over the equation? Uh -huh. is, it the, is it the length accumulated, or is it just like the specific length? Like right. L1, L, like L4, L4. It is the specific length, right? Okay. This is why I, I wrote section here as a sum. Oh. It's the length of that particular section. Yes. Other questions? All right, so, so we came this far. Let's, let's do a quick analysis. So in section one, what is your internal force? I know you're all doing this in your head now, right? That's, uh, that's an achievement because normally you have to write this on paper. Well, we did this a couple of times, so we, we can't follow. What is the internal force on uh, section one, that L4? P4. This is P4, right? Because you write the balance of forces, the only thing is P4 point. Okay, so the internal force, is it, what, what direction is it? Tension. Positive, tension, same, same thing, right? Everybody agree with that? Yes, why? Because uh, it's uh, the P4 on the end is in tension, so it should react. Yeah. P4 is in tension, so that needs to be in tension, right? Uh, to balance it out. So L4, your N is what? It's just P4 for that section of one. I don't know why I called them one before and it's L1, L2, L3. The other way around. So hopefully you don't get confused. Um, so N is that. You know the A, you know the elastic modulus, and you know the length, the length is L4. So you calculate that delta for the section L4. Okay? Next section. What's the internal force? So remember, we made a cut there, so we have an ex internal force, right? Keep, uh, keep uh, P3 in the back of your head for a second, but before that, we have internal force there, right? Because as soon as you make a cut, and one side has an internal force equal to P4 and intention, the other side has a, uh, a P4 and uh, intention as well, right? So what are the forces in the second section? So we have P4, right, let me, let me draw it. So this is, this is L3, right, second. So what, what we have, we have P4 in tension, right? This, this part is important, everybody follow this? Why do we have P4 in tension? Because the other side of this, which was in section one, had also the P4 intention. So these two are equal and opposite direction, right? Just to keep it out. This is internal force. Remember, there's, there's like this doesn't exist out, uh, outside of this uh, member. Okay, so we have P4 that's internal. And if you look at the 
video, I, I try to keep these consistent with the coloring, right? So I, I use a different color for internal and external voices so you can understand. All right, so we have P4 internal, and then what else? And then we have P3. That's external, and that's in compression, right? So what do we have on the other side? It's just a balance of these two, right? Whatever that number is. I don't. I mean, here we don't have numbers, but in that uh, problem that we did, we did have numbers. So, so you can actually got. Let's let's call it whatever p four minus p three, assuming p four is a bigger number. Yeah. So then, now we have everything here to plug it back into that equation, right? What's the end? What's the uh, internal force? It's just that, P4 minus P3, you know the area, you know the A, uh, uh, sorry, E, and then what's the length? Back to your question, what's the length? What's the length? It's just L3, right? Don't confuse it with L4 plus L3 or anything. This is just the section, L3, okay? Then you have your uh, delta for section two, you continue with delta for section one, and so on and so on. Okay? Any any questions? Um, one quick thing again here: the area here for these two is different from the area for L one and L two, right? Just uh, don't don't see that. Okay. Did you get this part? Wait, wait, P3 is the external force. Look up at uh, the actual problem. P3 is your external force. You're applying the P3 internal force, yeah. Remember, remember we did this for, for F4, we had it before here? Yeah. Oh, it's just that. It's just that, yeah. Again, if this confuses you, you can follow what the book says, and the book starts from the right end every time, right? So you have a P4 there, it's external, and you get to that point, you have to balance it out, okay? That works too, as long as you remember what length to use. Do you all feel like you got this? Yeah? Okay, good. All right, so I want to say this same kind of process works for, for torsion, right? For torsion, we will have a different uh, set of equations. So let me, let me ask you this, actually. So this was the change in length. Remember, delta was change in length, right? So what do you expect that to be for torsion? Change in. What was torsion again? Twisting, right? What was the assumption there? We assume that the length is constant, that doesn't change, the radius doesn't change, that's a constant, that was our assumption. What changes? I heard angle, yes? Angle of twist, right? That's, that's, okay, so I apply some torque at the end of this, and what happens? It rotates, right? Try to see the similarity between these two, right? So you have a, a member and you apply some external uh, uh, axial load, right? So you apply some axial load. What happens there? You're elongating your mem the member, right? So think of it the same way, but now we're just twisting it instead of pulling on it, right? I, I, we're twisting it. And what is changing here? The angle, right? There's there's some twist, right? If you can see your force kind of analogous to torque and the change in length somehow analogous to change in angle, right? The twist, everything else pretty much is similar. Does that make sense? So so hopefully you see you see that uh, kind of uh, being applied to uh, torsion as well. Other question? Yes, sir. Um, just for this specific um, like method of sections, I noticed with um, the third section you cut before P2, um, it's 
so that section three would be experiencing P4 minus P3 in compression, right? I should get attention, sorry. It yeah, it depends on the numbers. I don't have the numbers, but let's say, yeah, it's intention. It would be intention, right? Because it should be the opposite, yeah. Um, well, it's not always intention, right? If P3 is a bigger value than P4, oh, yeah. then that is compression, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, Okay. Yeah. But whatever it is, it, you, you don't care about that, right? Whatever that is, you have the same on the section on the left as well. So if this is intention, yeah. that means the other side of the cut on the left, that's also intention. Yeah. Okay. okay. That makes sense. Um, uh, I guess my follow-up question to that. So when you do like a section, so now you're doing a section four cut. Um, so you have that new force P2 and then plus the tension force from the old one. Yeah. Um, exactly. And you, you, would, you would figure out the force, with, from there we would figure out P1. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, see that. Does that make sense? Yeah, because then, I mean, you could make a fifth cut, but there's no point. Yeah, right. Right. Okay, good. So, let's go here. Um, so I think, again, if you can make the connection between axial deformation and torsional deformation, that, that helps you a lot, because all of your kind of knowledge, everything that you learn, is transferable here too, right? Of course, length becomes angle, linear or, or axial force becomes torsional force, you know, um, Young's modulus becomes what? If you remember from last time, Young's modulus becomes, uh, say what? I just know it's capital G. Capital J? J. The moment of inertia, right? Uh, and, and all of those things. But it's, you know, the, the rest of it is kind of uh, pretty similar. So let's do a quick uh, recap of what we had last time. We are applying some torque, T. And again, the important thing here was if the arrow is, you know, in the direction of your right thumb, the direction of twisting is what? It's the four fingers, it's counterclockwise, right? If it's going inwards, then it's the opposite. Yeah, I think that's the important thing to remember, right? Don't get confused by, oh, there's an arrow pointing that way, but for a moment, that's way. Okay, I think that's nicely kind of visualized here by that uh, drawing. So let's say we have a torque T applied to the end of this, uh, you know, uh, cylinder shaft, right? What happens? What was the deal with distance from the center of this shaft? Who remembers? Uh, at the center, there's no surface. There's no. Mm hmm. Okay, that's good. Movement or twist, right? So if you, again, you have a shaft that's attached, is, is fixed on one end, and then you're applying some torque to it, right? That torque causes this to twist, correct? The twist, the angle of twist is different depending on where you are, right, along the shaft, and then where you are in the radial direction, right? The radial direction hopefully is easy because you know, the, the amount of twist at the center line there is zero. There is no twist there, right? Uh, and, you know, we went through that exercise last time. You all had a pretty good kind of intuition for that. Um, but the maximum amount of uh, twist happens on the surface, right? Right around the periphery of that, that shaft. And so when we say twist, what do we really mean? You know, bring it back into mechanics of materials lingo. Uh, displacement. Displacement, okay. Are you more? Like, yeah, just between the shear. Shear is it shear stress, shear strain? Shear strain. Shear strain, right? Strain is the deformation, right? Stress is, is the amount of force, right? So you, you twist it, there is some shear strain happening there, right? Um, the shear strain is zero at the center, is maximum 
on the surface. Yeah? yeah. Now, second step. This is an elastic material. Let's say there is a, an elastic behavior in this material. What does that mean again? Linear elastic, let's say. Anyone? You apply, you apply a torque, but then you release the torque and it goes back. Yeah, yeah. As soon as you hear linear elastic, what does that mean? Even if you don't have information about the loading. What's the definition of a linear elastic material? Okay, that's half the definition. The strain is propor directly proportional to the load. Yes, I think you should say that. You know, your strain, it, your stress is proportionally related to strain times what? Strain times what? Times that modulus, right? Now, if it's a normal force, strain relates to. Yeah, right? So, so for linear load, you use Young's modulus or elastic modulus to uh, relate stress and strain. If it's. Um, what does that mean? What's going on? Resistance to uh, rotational deformation. 
Okay, so that was one equ equation. And then the other one that we had was how are tau and tau max correlated? Do you remember that one? What's that parentheses? You remember we mentioned if it goes, uh, you know, tau is linearly increasing from zero to that max value, right? And that linear um, factor is rho over c. So if your rho is zero, tau would be zero. If rho is c, so all the way on the surface, your tau is tau max, right? Hopefully you can see that. Yeah. So with this, you should be able to, let's say you have the torque key, you have all the geometric features of this shaft, which is included in that J, right? Uh, and you know you know the torque, so you can calculate from that top equation, you can calculate the maximum shear stress that you expect in the shaft, right? You, you have the maximum shear stress, and based on that you can calculate the shear stress on any point on that cross-section. Okay. That, that, it, yes, what is rho? Rho is um, the radial distance from the center, okay? Um, so like I was saying, it's, it's kind of similar to x in, in our uh, axial problem. What, what is c? c is the radius of the shaft. Okay. Is, is this hard to see somehow? c is this, and then rho is that. Yeah. What is J? J is the polar moment of inertia. Let me write it down. Polar moment of inertia. What is tau? No, no. <laughs> yeah. That's not, that's not that's one of my questions. I'm, I'm just curious why they use like C for radius instead of R, you know what I mean? Like, I have no idea, don't ask me that question. <laughs> so, I, yes, I, I feel your pain. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it does get better, you know, as, as you, you get uh, you know, into more complex, maybe, you know, graduate studies, at least then all of these um, uh, uh, variables will change to something else. So, I think the reason for that is, this is kind of old science, Right? Uh -huh. At different stages, different people came up with different notations. That's just me saying, I don't know if that's actually true. But, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I, I tried in the past to come up with my own notation, so R is radius, and, you know, R not, and people got more confused because it's different from the book, so. <laughs> just take it easy. <laughs> there was another question. Okay, good. So, um, now, what would J again? Remember, we, we uh, calculated J and uh, we had it especially for two different things. Remember, this was about uh, shaft and the uh, design of shafts and so on. So, in a lot of cases, we have circular cross sections, right? But we have two different types of them. One is solid circular cross section, like on the, you see on the left, and then one is tubular, so it's like a hollow cylinder, right? And I know I asked this last time as well, but let's say we apply the same torque. We have two shafts, same length, same material, uh, same radius, but one of them is solid, one of them is tubular like this, right? Um, if we apply the same torque, twisting moment, which one do you think will twist more? Yes or no? Yeah. Why? Or lower or That's very good. Because if uh, you, you know you look at this, everything else pretty much is the same except that J down down to this, right? The lower moment. And it is different uh, for for these two. Uh, and, and you'll see some form of this in exam, right? J for this. Is all right. Did you remember, remember that from last time? That's good. And so it's half pi c to the fourth. C was what? It's the 
radius of that shaft. You, you can see that in the diagram, right? So that's that's C, that's the radius, right? So what about the, the one on the right? Very good. So, uh, so I call this the outer and inner radius, outer and inner radius, right? So you subtract the, pretty much you subtract the empty space out of it, right? If, if you look at, uh, so, okay, how do we go from this to the, the one on the uh, left, the solid one? Do you agree if CI equals zero, these two are the same? CI is zero, so you you know you're you're kind of filling the whole space with it, and would they be the same? Yep. Right? Do you see that? So uh, I, I think that that helps, right? So whatever your inner radius is, you take that out of the, out of that space, uh, you you're subtracting from the polar moment of energy. You're subtracting from that resistance. Okay. Good. So. Uh, and look, look uh, over the material of the book to see how we derive these. That that should help you kind of understand better. But uh, I won't go through it. Okay. Right. If you do look at uh, over and you have questions, let me. Okay. So we have these two polar moments of inertia for, for these two types of uh, geometries. Let's see if we can um, get that in action. And this is what we ended last session with. Um, so we have two shafts. One is uh, solid and one is the tube. They're made of the same material. And the material has an allowable shear stress of 75 megapascals. What is allowable? Hmm? Max? What, what does that mean? What, what happens if I go over that allowable value? It will fail, right? And we don't want that, obviously. We, we want to be below that threshold always, otherwise our design is not very helpful. Okay, so now, you all as engineers, let's see if you can determine the maximum torque that we can apply to, um, to these two types of uh, shafts. And you have all the geometric information, let's say. So you, the outer radius is 100 millimeters. The lateral one is solid. In the second one, the inner radius is 75. We have J. 
or or we can calculate the A, right? We have all the information we need. And then what else? We have tau max, or we know what it can be, right? And then what's the what's the unknown here? Okay, so all you need to do is calculate that J based on the equation that I gave you. Um, let's see, what was J again? For which one? For, let's write it for both of them. For the left one. Yeah, and then the other one? Tau max, how do you get your tau at a given 
Ray on this is JC. It's just R, uh, Rho over C, the rest is the same. Yeah. How will we find this one? Yeah, the T, not the T class, the T. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the question. You have to find that T. Yeah, you have to find that T. Uh, what are you guys explaining? So, did, in the drawing, they have like the cross sectional cuts with some arrows on them. Like, um, on one yeah. that like, says like 75 MK. Yeah. Um, do you mind explaining all of those pictures? Okay, one second. Let, let me. Um, thank you. Yes. What's, what C do we use for second one? Yeah. Okay, right. So, so which one do you think gives you the, the bigger task, the, the bigger stress? Yeah, here or there? Yeah, I don't know. Why? It's farther from the center. Remember, that's linearly increases as you get away from the center, right? So, so you're interested in tau height, so you go to the average. Good. Did that thank you? Did that work out? Did you actually get what the point is? So we have everything here. You have to shuffle this, this equation, right? We will have everything except T. So you can't All right. Is it not active? Yeah. It is active. People are Um. OK. So. Did everyone vote? Okay. Yeah. So as you're, as you're trying to do that, let me uh, answer this other question. Right? So this is your question, right? So remember, everything that you're seeing here is on this cross section, right? It's in that plane. But in reality, if you think about it, this is a 3D problem, right? So, so we have, instead of a, a 2D uh, element, we will have a 3D Q element, right? I think I talked about this last time. So this is the Q element. This side of it is, is your uh, you know, front face, and that side is kind of internal to the shaft, right? The idea is, uh, since this is a static problem, those two forces are going to be the same in opposite directions, just to keep balance. Right? But if you really want to kind of know the, the story behind this, this is a 3D um, problem. Each set, uh, face of, uh, of that cube has a shear stress, a normal stress, you know, uh, uh, I guess two shear stresses and one normal stress. Right? If this is pure torsion, there's no normal force there. It's all going to be shear, and then one, one shear on this face, little face, and then one shear on this little face equal. That's what they, they mean. Okay. All right. That's how you come up with like, the other two portions that are at the back, right? Because you have the back. Um, they have to cancel out the first. Oh yeah, this is a better picture. picture. Yeah. Exactly. Because there's one that cancels. There's one that like, acts as adjacent. Um, to there. Um, yeah. Why does it point out um, the one that comes from inside the circle? Point point out meaning this right here? Um, this face? No, the other face. The one on top. This one? Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, focus on this face on our cross section, right? Do you agree that the direction of the arrow is awkward? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That has to be awkward because of the torque, right? Yeah. That's the torque. So in order to cancel that out, what do we need here? Is it this way or that way? That arrow. But it's actually perpendicular, so why would that be? Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, perpendicular, it shouldn't rotate still. Right? Oh, okay. It's uh, balanced. Because if you pointed it the other way from a rotating part, it would be that, which would be really weird. Exactly. Oh, um, that's exactly. Okay, oh, question. Uh, yeah. If, if it's supposed to be um, perpendicular, it has to come uh, in another square. Another square, it's, it's not. It's, uh, 
when force is applied over a distance, that's um, so, so work is defined as F force divided by D distance, right? That's for axial load, correct? You all know that. Okay, so how do we calculate that for torque and rotational force? Remember, linear force, torque, yes, exactly. Linear force F, torque T, these are kind of analogous, remember? Uh, linear distance, axial distance, delta or D, whatever you call it, and then angle uh, in up to us. Okay, so what is work in for, for power transmission for, for jet? In torque applied over angle twist. Torque divide, uh, times angle of twist or angle of rotation, let's call it theta, whatever. And then power is the time derivative. which is T times D theta over D time, T, or you know, you call this as, what is D theta? Theta, theta is angle, right? So when you time derivative theta, what do you get? Change in angle over time, or in other words, did someone say omega? I heard, what is omega? Angular velocity. Angular velocity, right? Change, change in length in time is velocity. Change in angle in time is angular velocity, right? I, keep, I, I just keep kind of going back to this, uh, you know, property of them being similar and analogous in different, uh, pretty much coordinate systems, right? So, you know, um, there's not much uh, problems to solve. It's, it's just a quick kind of side note. Okay. But we do want to be able to calculate that angle of twist, um, which is what I'm going to talk about next. So angle of twist, um, and I'm talking about this uh, before, right? Uh, for, for long um, shafts that are uh, subjected to uh, angular force, or in other words, torque, they do tend to have uh, angular deformation, right? We, we talk about this. There's there's some elastic to it, and this could still be elastic, right? Because if you remove that force, it will, it will go back to its original position, uh, no problem. But because of that uh, uh, twisting moment, it has some. So we want to uh, kind of um, calculate what that is, right? Again, a couple of assumptions before we uh, go on. One is this cross section area remains the same. Okay, the cross-section area doesn't change along the x-axis that we have there. And the material, let's say, is homogeneous, meaning what again? Same properties uh, anywhere on the shaft you go, the same properties of that material, right? It's elastic with such and such, shear modulus, and so on. And uh, you know who remembers that Salmonon principle? You remember that? The name ring a bell? Say that again. The, the name is very unique. You should remember the name at least. Salmonon principle? Huh? What was the name? Salmonon. That's French for I don't know. Saying saying something. <laughs> Yeah, um, you remember when we uh, had axial load on a, on a member, right? We said towards the end of them, they had some boundary effects that were, you know, kind of the, the, the linear line, the grid lines will change, you know, you remember that? And the idea was if you're away enough, sufficiently away from the two boundaries, the lines, the grid lines remains uh, straight, right? That was the idea. So the same thing happens here. If you're away, uh, you know, uh, sufficiently uh, away from the two ends when you're applying the twist, we can use those principles of you know elasticity, small angle, and, and so on, assuming that none of those kind of boundary effects exist. Okay, same idea. 
Okay. Um, so here, we assume that we have a disk, exactly like before, right? There we had a uh, differential element. Remember that? If we had a differential element there, and we applied uh, uh, axial load, we have a differential uh, disk element here as well, and we have a torque here instead, right? I talked about this last time. I think this is a better picture, maybe uh, you know, less confusing. But the idea is, from the back face of this disk to the front, there is a small twist, right? So, so you will have a small twist if you have a disk here, and then another small twist if you have a disk there. Small twist, and then you know, when you get to the end of this uh, shaft, all of these small twists add up, and then you have some angle of uh, twist, angle of rotation. Does that make sense? So the, the question is, okay, what is that angle of twist uh, for this particular disk? And hopefully you see the next step, which is going to be, okay, we have the angle of twist for this disk, and then what do we do? We integrate it over mm -hmm. the length, we get that total angle of twist, right? Just like before. All right. So we have a 3D element in this disk. It has length dx. And it is located at distance rho from the center, so here. And rho changes from 0 to c, remember? Right? Um, so we have this little element there. And from the back uh, face to the front face, there is a tiny angle of twist, right? That makes sense? Because of that tiny angle of twist, what do we have here? Strain, shear strain gamma. Yes? So let's uh, go through this one more time. The, le the, the thickness of that disk is dx, right, from here to here. That's the x. That was easy. Then we assume from the back face to the front face there is a, tungle, a tiny angle d phi, d phi, d phi um, that we have an extra amount of twist um, in the front face. Okay? Because of that d phi here, we have some shear strain back to, uh, in, in, which is that angle, and we call that gamma. Right? Shear strain is always gamma. We had that before too. Um, okay. So, and again, in this problem, we have you know T one, T two, T three, and whatever else you might have. Uh, you know, you, you can assume there there's a you know belt that's that's. You know, transmitting power at this point, there's a belt at the end, some here, you know, uh, there's a support there, all of those, these are all internal uh, torque sets that you have. Uh, and because of that, your internal torque, internal moment, is changing depending on where you are along the x axis, right? Does that, does that ring a bell? What do we do? What are we supposed to do here if the internal torque is changing? Remember, if the internal forces were changing, Method of sections, right? So you go section by section. In that section, your, your T is, uh, is constant, OK? So um, tell me again, what was delta? Delta being change in length? Integral of n a e dx, correct? I want you to help me write um, this for phi. The angle of twist. And you can certainly derive this, but I'm, I'm just asking based on your uh, information up there what you think this could be. So, internal force, we have, can I write T here? That's the torque. What what else? Uh-huh. A becomes what? J. Uh, very good. J. 
There A, A was where, where you apply all the force. Here is, is J, polar moment of inertia. And then instead of E, we have G, which is what? Shear modulus, right? So let me write these again here for you. Shear modulus. This is polar moment of inertia. And this is the internal torque, right? And then you integrate over x from 0 to m. OK? Definitely, definitely look uh, uh, at that particular section and read this section and see how we derive this. But, but, hold on a second. Uh, but, but I uh, want you to see how these two are similar, right? Like I said, if you know how to solve that problem for, uh, for a, an axial load in a member, you should be able to do the same in, um, you know, uh, shafts under uh, external torque. Okay. The the formulation is different in that you know force becomes torque, area becomes flow, moment of inertia, and so on. But in the end, uh, you know, the method of sections would apply here as well. Okay. What was the question? Uh, so the length being represented that is the radius. No, no, no. Length, length is from from zero from here, which is let's say this is uh, supported in the wall, right? This is this is fixed in the wall, and all the way to here. That's your length. And then for this particular example, what do you think our sections would be? Let's say I start from the free end here and go that way. So the first section would be here, right? And then the second section would be all the way at the end. Yeah? In the end, this is your, uh, this is your fee that you want to calculate, right? Again, like before, assuming your, the, the shaft is of the same material, so area doesn't change, material is the same, uh, and, and there's no external forces addition, right? You can write this as what? You, you can simplify that equation as TL over JG, okay? And then, what if I have another section in addition to this with a different internal torque? What do I do? I just sum it up, right? Quick question? Yes. Um, is G generally a different number than D? Is G is a what? Is, so G is like the shear modulus, right? Yes. Um, is that generally a much different number than D? It's a smaller number than D. For sure. Okay. These material shears are generally weaker, right? So not... They, they uh, shear more easily. Yeah. 
All right, so it's like with the elastic modulus with different materials. Right, yes. Or, or you know, some part of it is heated for whatever reason, right? It's, yeah. Uh, sign convention, you are all experts in this now. What's the sign convention? What is positive? Thumb sticking out, right? That's positive. We take that as uh, counterclockwise, that's positive. So, you know, hopefully you know that by now. Um, and let's do a quick example. We have a few minutes. Um, let's do a quick example. This is, hopefully, if you've looked at uh, uh, problems for the winter if you see something like this, right? Yeah? That gearbox thing? That's exactly what it is. So, uh, so we have a steel shaft, okay, which has a diameter of 200 millimeters, so the diameter is constant, making your life easy, a little easy here. Um, so the, the, the radius is constant, the material is constant. What is the one thing that is not constant? The torques. The torques, right? The internal torques. So, so you have different external torques applied here at different uh, locations. So what do we do here? Another section. So let's say we are you are interested in the amount of rotation or the angle of twist at point A. How do we do that? What was the um, what was the equation again? So you have to calculate that angle of speed for each of these sections. All right. Did you flip? Uh, I'll give you G. Um, let, me, let me look for that. But let's say you know that, okay? Yeah. So you don't see this 60 kilometer yeah, torque 
and then your internal torque will be what? It would be the same exact uh, torque that you see at point B, right? So if that is negative 10, that would also be negative 10, right? And, and then, and then we have another section from C. So let me draw this here. So right before C, I made it. But, and then I have C. So at C, I have what? I have two torques now, right? One is, one is the negative 10. The other one is another negative 60, so it would be negative, negative 70, right? Minus 10, minus 60, that's minus 70, yeah. Wait, so if you do a reaction of the first right one, then once you look at the next one, isn't the other way around? It is the other way around, but it is negative still, right? You have to, so when you, when you make a cut, right? When you make a cut, the two sections that are adjacent, they have the same exact um, internal force or torque or whatever. So if that is negative, the other one will also be negative. The, section, the, direct, hold on. Uh, the directions are different, right? Because you're looking at this face versus this face, right? Yeah, so from section, um, if we cut right before B, uh, um, right before B, okay? Uh, okay, sorry. Wait, we're still, sorry. Are you a step out of us? A B or C? Okay. But, uh, no, I got the cut before C. Was, okay, I jumped ahead. Good. Um, so, so then we have negative 60 here, right? Uh, sorry, negative 70. Minus 10, minus 60. So if we have what the value might be? Then, wait, wait, look, uh, I'm still in this section, right? In this section, we have negative 70 and negative 70, right? So you can see that. And then we, we move on to this next section, which is we have a negative 70, odd is positive 150, so odd is positive 80. And you already have positive A there, you know, that's, that's your So hopefully if you draw your torque versus X diagrams, it's going to look like this. It starts with negative 10, which was the CD section, goes down to negative 70, which was the DC section, right? And then it jumps up to a positive 80, which was the AB section. Question. What was that again? CD, why is it negative? Uh, so that's the torque, right? And the decision was if the thumb is pointing inwards, in other words, if you have clockwise, uh, uh, that's negative. If the thumb is pointing outwards, that's positive. It's just a measure, right? If you come back, and say this one is positive 10, that one is positive 70, and that one is negative 80 at the end, it still works out fine, as long as you're consistent. Well, I mean, we still kind of talk about 